welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 53 of the Madden America podcast. This week, MIA Radio presents the fourth in a series of interviews on the topic of the global mental health movement. This series is being developed through a UMass Boston initiative supported by a grant from the Open Society Foundation. The interviews are being led by UMass PhD students who also comprise the Madden America Research News Team and today's interview is hosted by Justin Carter. Thanks James. We continue our series of interviews on the global mental health movement in response to the recent UK summit and the Lancet report. Over the past three weeks, we have published interviews with many of the leading voices in this debate. Immediately following the release of the report and the beginning of the summit on World Mental Health Day, psychiatric epidemiologist Dr. Melissa Raven was on the MIA podcast. She questioned the evidence base of the movement, pointing to statistical issues in the prevalence rates of mental disorders internationally, and called for a focus on addressing barriers to health rather than on individualized treatment. Mental health service user activist Jilmil Breckenridge of the Bohr Foundation in India and Dr. Bhargavi Devar of Transforming Communities for Inclusion, TCI Asia Pacific, were also on the podcast. Each discussed the lack of involvement of service user and disability rights groups in the UK summit and the Lancet report and laid out alternative frameworks for addressing distress in ways that are sensitive to culture and social context. Next, Dr. China Mills, a critical psychologist and author of Decolonizing Global Mental Health, spoke to my colleague Zenobia Morrill about her experience attending the UK summit and the lack of attention that has been given to the ways in which austerity policies in Britain have contributed to the increased demand for mental health interventions. Today, I am very pleased to announce that we are joined by Dr. Derek Summerfield. Dr. Derek Summerfield is an honorary senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry in London and former research associate at the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford and former consultant at Oxfam. He was born in South Africa and trained in medicine and psychiatry at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London. Dr. Summerfield has published hundreds of articles in medicine and social science and has contributed widely to the understanding of the impact of war-related trauma and torture on people around the world. He has also been an outspoken critic of the global mental health movement for several years criticizing the medicalization of trauma through PTSD, the exaggerated prevalence rates in the epidemiological data, and the lack of awareness Mm -hmm. of the different cultural experiences and understandings of distress. Welcome to the Madden America podcast, Dr. Summerfield. Thanks, Justin. Good to be here, man. Great to have you. How did you first become critical of attempts at cross-cultural psychiatry? Did this skepticism emerge early in your training as a psychiatrist? Not Absolutely immediately, but I would say the background skepticism in some ways arose from the fact I grew up in Africa, but of course I grew up as a white man in what was still colonial Rhodesia. And one could see uh, you know, early on that uh, Africa was a white construction and how Africans uh, saw their own continent and colonization really didn't get into what we call formal knowledge. So it was clear from the beginning that it was like colonized peoples were encouraged to see themselves in relation to the reflection of themselves they saw in the eyes, the, in the, in the eyes of, if you like, the white colonizers. There's obviously a whole literature on this, which has some bearing on some of our critiques, really, about global mental health. The writings of Franz Fanon, uh, Aimé Césaire, uh, and those sort of people, black skins, white masks. So whose knowledge counts, I suppose, uh, because of uh, my background as a, a white colonial subject, did start to sort of seep in to uh, my psychiatric training, albeit our training, you know, was a London medical school training, St. George's Hospital. It was entirely mainstream. It had no, it gave no particular space to issues of sociology or culture and mentalities or the impact of poverty, nothing like that. It was a narrowly, you know, technical sort of program. Uh, Everyone came and did their spiel. And I suppose I emerged quite dissatisfied from all of that. I also then did some field work during the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua, uh, largely amongst landless and uh, illiterate peasants who'd been displaced and suffered atrocities in the war at, of course, the behest of the USA. One must say where these things come from. And clearly, um, attempts to, to do some, some Western psychiatric research or to use quantitative instruments like the general health questionnaire, once I tried, were obviously ridiculous, you know. Uh, it didn't capture anything about these people. Um, they were highly symptomatic if you asked them the questions, you know, on a general health questionnaire, or if you like a PTSD questionnaire, 
but in no sense could you describe them as a case of something. They were still active and effective. You know, they'd been suffering. Uh, they were alert. They were still in the war zone. And it was clear that, uh, you know, the, psych- the Western psychiatric writ didn't really capture what was going on here. So that was, that was halfway through my psychiatric training. I took a year out to go to Nicaragua and do that sort of stuff. Since when, I suppose, through contact, uh, Justin, I worked for nine years at the Medical Foundation for Vic- Victims of Torture, which was an NGO that took people who had those experiences or other human rights violations and who were asylum seekers and refugees in Britain or from foreign countries. And I suppose I assessed about 900 of those people. It would have been easy if you wanted to put them into Western categories, PTSD, depression, all that. I didn't find that was useful. And latterly, I worked for 16 years the last year with in an HIV field here in London. Half the patients I saw were African women with HIV and many other problems. You can imagine children who are HIV positive. Uh, the British government wanted to throw them out back to their country where there weren't drugs, like Zimbabwe, my own country, and where they were deaf or die. They, if their asylum application failed, they'd die. And one could see how little purchase these categories had on their predicaments, which were real, you know, and how quickly uh, terms like psychosis got attached to them merely because they heard voices, which is, you know, a normal expression of distress in an African or other non-Western person, a standalone voices. They had that. They got dumped in the depression category like everyone else in the world. Uh, It had no purchase on their problems. And obviously, so this this was my background. And, you know, when I lecture to to psychiatry and training, I always say to them, look, don't make a diagnosis if you don't have to, you know? It's not, <laughs> it's not compulsory. If the diagnosis doesn't really add much to your overall sense of it, and if it might detract from your overall sense of the nuances of it, don't make one. But I suppose I've got my teeth into cross for the last 15 years or so and quite, been quite struck about how the mainstream uh, respond to this critique. Uh, how did well, you become such a prominent critic of the global mental health movement over the past several yeah. years? How has the field responded to this critique that you're making? Well, it's not just to me. I mean, certainly in London, uh, I mean, in Britain, there's a sort of a group called the Critical Psychiatry Network. They're mostly psychiatrists. I think some are psychologists looking at some of these questions. And what's very striking, actually, is that whilst we get stuff published, though it's harder to command the big space and the big journals that the mainstream people do, global health people and all that sort of thing. But what is interesting is that um, no one attempts to rebut our stuff. They just ignore it. And when you look at the sort of mainstream, uh, you know, piece on, you know, whether it's on depression or on um, anything, you know, in third world things, you look at the mainstream and the global mental health people in particular, if you look at their papers, and they never cite papers from the critical side, even to rebut them. They don't attempt to rebut it. They don't want to engage with it, it seems to me. And I have my reasons that might emerge a later as to why that might be. But I think they feel they've got a system working for them. And so I would say, broadly speaking, to answer your question, the, the mainstream, uh, the biomedical, you know, psychiatry mainstream largely ignores this stuff. It is not engaged with it. It is not attempted to engage with it. I like to think we've engaged with them by the nature of it, but I don't think they have been very interested to do that. It reminds me of um, an interview I read with Noam Chomsky, where he talked about the difficulty in trying to say something very countercultural in a short period of yes. time and being brought yes. out of the news um, to talk about terrorism in the world and to say something like, well, the U.S. is a purveyor of terrorism as well. And then you have to cut yes. the commercial break and not having a chance to explain that or to yes. welcome people yes. into engage with your views. I'm wondering if there's sort of a similar feeling in the work that you're doing. Not necessarily. I mean, we, we, we said uh, stuff that is critical and skeptical and ask fundamental questions, and we'll come on to them perhaps in a few minutes, do claim a space in, in the journals, uh, not as much space but I'm just struck by the fact that the mainstream people don't attempt to, to come back and write stuff in the journal or to rebut. They largely ignore it. To me, the one fundamental reason why is that they, they haven't really got an answer to at least what for me is the core epistemological issue in the whole critique, which is the issue of validity in psychiatric research. It seems to me that 95% of the literature in Western journals in English about non-Western subjects can be thrown out of the window because it fails this fundamental test. And if you're using the methodology that fails the validity test, nothing can, be, nothing can be resolved. I mean, it can't be rectified. You, know? you may have a standardized method and you're repeating it in all your various centers where you've got subjects, but if that standardized method is based on invalid methodologies and approaches, then the whole thing, can, you know, the thing cannot be fixed. And they have never attempted to answer that. Um, with one exception, I remember a professor of psychiatry in London uh, is saying, a uh, big professor, 
yeah, it's true. In a meeting, uh, when I brought this up with psychiatric training, he said, yeah, it's true. We don't have validity in psychiatric research. That is to say, you know, we don't, we can't be sure that when we, when we look for something in Cambodia, you know, we have a valid instrument to capture what it is we think we have. We don't have that. What we've got is reliability, which is I doing the same thing over and over again. And we're just going to have to be getting on with that, which is a sort of upper chick sort of answer. You know, we've got a functioning system, you know, what's the, you know, and it's not perfect, but it's a functioning system and a great deal of interests are involved in this. And, you know, clearly there are uh, all sorts all over the world. There are masters of global mental health. You know, it's, it's, it's a master's, it's a postgrad degree that's been set up in some numbers over here now. You know, it's sort of working, really. But their answer, I cannot get an answer out of them out about the fundamental questions about what do you do about invalid research? I mean, how can you take a question as supposedly capturing depression, you know, in the USA or in Britain and take it to Cambodia and ask the same questions? I mean, they may say yes to some, no to some, and assume that that is capturing something valid. For those people how can this be but you I see if you own the validity problem the whole a great deal of the whole global mental health enterprise grinds to a halt because it cannot solve this problem yeah and it cannot solve the sort of philosophical the philosophical problem of, of saying well firstly are we sure we can define mental sort in the west firstly and then we'll see whether this carries over with or without a passport to the non-western worlds very very you know with very different Backgrounds, traditions, ideas about why we're on earth, mentalities, you know, modes of expression of help seeking, all that sort of thing. There's no answer to that question. Indeed, there's no answer to the question of what a mental disorder is in the West. It's a philosophical problem, actually. All we say is, well, we don't really know, but what we've got is we've devised a method with certain sort of criteria. And if, they, if enough of them are satisfied, we declare a mental disorder to be born, you know, which is a kind of alchemy. You know what alchemy? Remember those alchemists in the Middle Ages? who were for a long time were preoccupied with the idea that if you get various base metals and you mix them in just the right proportions and do this and that and you know, turn the vessels upside down or heat them, you could turn it into gold. A piece of gold would be born. Well, there's a sense in which, especially the, you know, the, the so-called common mental disorders categories, you know, we have given birth to them via committee decisions. That doesn't mean the people to whom they might be applied are not suffering from something whether it's something that needs to be seen in the realm of psychiatry and medicine uh, in a way that wouldn't have been done a few years ago is another matter. But in, since we can't even find Western disorder in the West, a mental disorder in the West, even though we are told that one person in four in the society at any one time, your society, our society, um, may well have a mental disorder, even though one in seven UK and I believe similar proportion in the US citizens are taking antidepressant at any one time, we can't define it. We can't really define depression except in terms of a checklist we've got, more or less. So, I mean, we're left with this, you know, this fundamental um, philosophical and epistemological problem about what is a mental disorder, even in the West, from which our attempts at defining it have come. And then you go abroad with it. But the global mental health people don't seem to be too worried about this. And they essentially are, it seems to me, wishing to expand and to scale up the products of the Western mental health industry, which means its diagnoses. It's therapeutic practices, it's medications, without it being asked for, you know. And they are berating, um, you know, ministers of very poor countries that why don't you spend more on mental health when they're spending maybe three or four dollars per year per each per average citizen in a country like Zimbabwe. You know, it's been very disappointing that we cannot have, we don't really have a way of coming to grips with the mainstream other than through these articles because they don't really want to know. A past president of the Royal College of Psychiatry here in London, when I pressed him on this and I said, you know, there were, there were very high IQ people who were involved in critical psychiatry, had published a lot, some of them were professors, this, that, and the other. Why are they not part of the rich tapestry, you know, of psychiatric, <laughs> psychiatric finery? He said, because you're too negative. You know, you're not cheerleading for the profession of something. You know, you're not asking for more money. And, but moreover, I suppose it's hard for them to digest it. I mean, I personally think that the Western mental health industry is out of control. I say that soberly, out of control. That is to say, it has carved out a cultural space alongside longer-term secular developments within Western culture. It has carved out a cultural space. It appears to be able to give informed and evidence-based answers to questions, you know, to do with madness and unhappiness um, and, you know, violence and into a family uh, dispute, all sorts of things, when it hasn't begun to have uh, a conceptual and evidence base to capture, you know, even a fraction of the cultural territory which it ranges over. And 
they don't seem to ask, you know, no one seems to ask, well, I mean, what does it mean that one in seven or one in eight of the general population are on a, a drug, you know, on the basis of a category called depression, which no one even talked about till the 50s? No one. It, this seems to me to be an industry reproducing itself. And of course, if you're basing things on quantitative checklists, lists, then clearly you reify subjective consciousness and turn it into a category in front of your eyes. But, you know, I mean, if one in four people, Justin, I don't know, these sort of figures are used in America, sometimes one in four, one in six in America or in Britain have got a mental disorder, this must be something we are wading knee deep in in our society and we can't even define it. So I suppose the explosion of the field, explosive you know, enlargement of the field, of the number of categories in DSM, et cetera, of the likelihood that someone's on medicines and the likelihood that someone's been put on prescribed medicine and left on them for some years, these have all grown enormously. And um, I think, you know, clearly a number of us are, um, more than a number of us, at various sorts of levels. And of course, the users have their own take on this. A number of us are, um, see this as uh, very, very problematic, actually. If you like an emergent cultural development, and it's trading on the fact that, of course, the average citizen has come to incorporate the language and ideas of mental health into his or her personal identity and into the vocabulary used to express experience. You know? And in many ways, you could say that what the, if you, the layer under that, underneath that is one of the, uh, you know, the signal trends in the 20th century, which is the replacement by a secular and medical vocabulary of words to capture things which previously laid elsewhere, like with religion and the like, number one. Number two, the, above all, the fact that as recently as... Uh, say the 60s, even 70s, on the whole, though it wasn't necessarily made explicit, the cultural definition of a person in the West was seen as someone who could on the whole be relied upon to be reasonably resilient. And although terrible things might happen, if you like, society generally expected the majority of those victims to pick themselves up and carry on. Yeah? And that has been replaced by a culture of, of vulnerability. We now see people as vulnerable. The person discussed this best and this was in the 70s, a book of remarkable prophecy was, of course, Ivan Illich's Medical Nemesis. Uh, you know, that blog was prophetic, and it talked a bit about what it called cultural iatrogenesis, which is that a cadre of professionals is supposed to solve these problems, including mental health professionals, you know, directly and indirectly contribute to the idea that people are much weaker than they, they used to think they were. And in a sense, then, we become weaker, you know, we become this resilient, you know, the the sort of normal modes of being suggest that, you know, we, um, we need to see someone, we need something needs to happen. And we've got these professionals. And of course, the, you know, the, psych the, the psychiatric and psychology professions and the counseling professions in the last 20, 30 years have hugely burgeoned, you know, huge, it's a huge industry now, huge industry. I mean, in Britain, there's a quarter of a billion pounds goes just to buy antidepressants on the National Health Service. So, I mean, anyway, Ivan Illich was a, is a key figure in, uh, in that business. But, of course, psychiatry has seen itself as a branch of medicine and has sought to use the methodologies that medicine has used to investigate the technical secrets of the human body to use a similar sort of approach to mind. Obviously, they work best when you're dealing with brain, not mind. You know, having just worked 16 years in HIV, I had to cover people, often young people coming in with acute cephalopathies, you know, in acute HIV-related brain infections and inflammations. Now, that's definitely a physical illness, you know. And once you can stay in the idiom of brain, of course, then standard applications of research, etc., are much sounder because you've got something you can get a hold on, you know. With screening and with pictures and, and, and with um, scans and whatever, you've got something you can get a hold on. But 95% of psychiatry is obviously operates in the idiom of mind. And we've made the assumption we can, we can sort of think about mind and investigate it in the ways we think about body. And that's, you know, has shown to be very, very limited, it seems to me. Yeah. So it's also followed uh, that we could take our diagnostic contract around the world. I remember you, you mentioned Noam Chomsky. Chomsky once described Western scholarship in relation to the wider world as being affected by naivety and self-righteousness. And boy, that is true in the idea of international mental health, really. No one has proved that taking Western categories and approaches to treatment are right around the world seems immediately to do good. You know, no one has shown that particularly. I mean, they're just taken there. And when you look at DSM or something, you can see there that Western psychiatric thought is seen to be universalist, can go anywhere. 
Whereas non-Western thought often garnered in the side of the journal as cross-cultural syndromes, yeah, are acknowledged to have some validity, but only locally. So our thinking is universal and international, and local thinking is local. Well, that is the precise dynamic that, of course, Franz Fanon and Césaire and all that plot we're talking about, uh, which I saw growing up in, in what was then White Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, is that there were different kinds of knowledge and the Western man, the white man's knowledge was considered definitive. And you see this totally in psychiatry. So above all, you know, many of these, these uh, government health are talking about some of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, some of this has gone to Zimbabwe, which begin you know, a big question about mentalities. And then uh, to me, the big polls are culture and traditional ways of understanding things and seeing things and what is mentality and all this. And the others, of course, um, society, and that means poverty. You know, you mentioned yourself, what, doing mental health work in a broken social world is, I don't know. Um, why would they want to be thinking about the space between their ears uh, when they uh, can't feed the kids tomorrow? You know? And how do you separate understandable, you know, understandable despair and unhappiness from a category called depression? In your work, you've raised issues with the application of Western screening instruments and diagnostic constructs in different cultures around the world. Our previous guests on this podcast have suggested that Western psychiatrists get their own house in order before exporting these concepts and instruments. What are some of the issues with our diagnostic constructs and the screening instruments we've developed based on them? And what issues do they pose in the West? Taking all of these issues into consideration, what additional problems are added when adapting these concepts and tools in different cultures? I mean, I'm also critiquing, underneath all of this is a really, you know, also a skeptical critique of what Western psychology and psychiatry are doing in their own societies, yeah? And clearly, using quantitative instruments to capture, like general health question, or to try and capture the possible prevalence of mental disorder in, uh, in Western societies is just as bad. I mean, you can't reduce the, you know, you don't, I just don't think it's that quantitative work, broadly speaking, in the realm of mind, you know, is a philosophical problem, really. And the funny thing was, uh, one of the most widely used screening instruments in the world is called the General Health Questionnaire. And it was co-invented, co-drawn up by a famous British psychiatrist called Sir David Goldberg. Well, by chance, one day I was at a dinner. So by absolute chance, he was sitting next to me. So I said to him, Sir David, I've tried to use your General Health Questionnaire in, in Nicaragua and war wounded and that sort of thing. It's used around the world as often cited as a means of gathering hard, hard data on population prevalences. Is that what you intended? I mean, what did you write it for? And he said to me, I wrote it to capture distress. That's all, generic distress. I said, you realize that's being used then? <laughs> I couldn't seem to get him alarmed. But clearly, uh, to me, these, these sort of questions are fundamental. But when you ask in your one question, what additional problems are added when adapting these concepts and tools in different cultures, I think this is the issue. I personally think they can't, they should not be adapted. I don't think they should be taken there. I think that... Uh, if you used anthropological methods, let's, let's try and get at what might be considered some local version of mental disorders in uh, Zimbabwe or in Nicaragua or something. To do that, you'd have to go there and use really anthropological methods rather than individuated psychiatric research methods. Anthropological methods to get at what sort of categories of disorder uh, emerge in that society and what, how people saw them when they, you know, you know where they so send someone to the witch doctor, when they send someone to the hospital. You know, they have their own ways of deciding these things. The idea that you could take Western tools and with, quote, unquote, adaptation and good translation and back translation, you can turn them into something, it, again, is ridiculous. It's like saying, okay, well, there's this depression, there's this category called depression. Let's see how we can alter depression questionnaires to make them more, quote, unquote, culture stands for whatever. But the starting point is already the problem. You're starting from this, this construct you're calling depression. Yeah? Well, that's already too far. That's already too far. So what you see is that we want to go out there and do our stuff, our research stuff, we Westerners, yeah? And we brought the tools with us. We're starting with our stuff and we're seeing whether we can adapt it rather than starting with where they are to see what moves towards possibly some aspects of Western mental health approaches and where we could be useful. And there are places, you know, clearly some medications are, uh, would, would be something I'd see as, as essential in rural health clinics in Africa, and that might include an antipsychotic or some sort of sedative, might include antiepileptics, it would not include antidepressants, and it wouldn't include the idea that people should be put on antipsychotics for a long time. So I don't think they are adaptable, personally, um, just by good translation and all that. 
I think you've got to start there and, and see what comes towards you. But uh, Western, you know, Western psychiatrists now are not interested in doing that. And they scarcely, on the whole, what's also striking about the global mental health movement is that they make no reference whatsoever to anthropology. You'd think that medical anthropology had never been invented. Because many of these things have been discussed by anthropology, but the mainstream psychiatry literature does not quote anthropologists very seldom. I know that you have done some of this work and looked a lot at medical anthropology, particularly around the issue of what might be understood as depression in the West. So yes. last year, Let's the World Health Organization it. ran a year-long campaign on depression that suggested that undiagnosed and untreated depression in particular is hindering the economic development of low- and middle-income countries. In your writing, you've explored different culturally bound understandings of experiences that might be understood as depression, such as the concept of thinking too much in Southern Africa or the idea of nervi in post-Soviet Latvia. How do these experiences differ from Western depression? What's the danger in misunderstanding them as depression? Well, the WHO, I think, in this respect, has completely lost the plot. Um, When the Lancet Global Mental Health Series, which is a a medical... the influential medical journal, The Lancet, published when they started this in 2007, they quoted the WHO as saying that in any one year, one person in three on earth will develop a mental disorder, quote, though largely hidden. (laughs) I would say largely hidden from the people themselves. One in three. I remember a friend of mine commenting, uh, Professor David Ingby, saying to me, anyone who believes that one person in three on earth is going to develop a mental disorder in any one year must be living on another, some other planet. Can't be here. So, for a long time now, WHO is happy to use one single word, depression, undefined and unnuanced, and to talk about it as something as a global epidemic. Indeed, for a long time, they've been saying, uh, really for about 18 years or so, from around 2000, that depression, which they don't qualify or define, is the number two and perhaps due to be the number one most burdensome disease of any in the world. In other words, more burdensome than cardiovascular disease, more burdensome than AIDS. You know, 1.4 million people die every year of AIDS. Yeah? And there are, at this moment, 37 million people carrying it as a chronic uh, health condition. TB is much the same. About 1.3 people, million, million people die of TB. Even, even malaria, two-thirds of a million people die of TB per year. But depression is burden, more burdensome than all of those. And this word will do. And this is the World Health Organization. You know, I, I think it's embarrassing. It's, it, it, you know, the shallowness is staggering. It's very interesting, actually, um, that in Zimbabwe, I teach medical students. They're fourth-year medical students, you know, local people, fourth-year medical students. And they've been reading the white man's textbooks. So I come and we do clinical studies, and I say to them, how many of you uh, believe that there's such a thing, such a condition, medical condition, as depression in Zimbabwe, and there's always been? And about two-thirds of them put up their hand and say, yes, because they are honoring uh, the, if you like, the, the impulse to show that they are worthy of admission to a rational universe, as Franz von Ohn once put it, yeah? And they read it in the books, they've come to believe it, even though they've never heard about such a thing or ever thought to myself, that person's got to, you know, they, their own background has very different other ways of understanding them. African attributional systems are very different. They tend to be external and coming in on you rather than arising inside. So I said to them, oh, so two-thirds of you think there's been such a thing as depression? Yeah, I said. So then I talked to them about the, a local syndrome there, which you mentioned yourself, uh, kifungisisu, which means thinking too much, which some people like Dick and Patel of the general, uh, of the, you know, the government health people have taken to be, oh, well, let's just call that depression. So I, I said to them, right, now, can you tell me the difference between kifungisisu, which you've known, you've grown up with, it's a Zimbabwean indigenous uh, category, yeah? not seen as a medical one. What's the difference between kifungisisu and depression, operationally? Tell me the difference. Well, they can't. They were just saying, it's the white man's knowledge. You know, kifungisisu, well, that's not in the books. Depression's in the books. The books are written in English. They're written overseas. They come out here. We've been examined on this stuff. This is what a modern doctor, doctor talks about. It doesn't talk about kifungisisu. So I don't know what depression or its equivalence might mean in poverty-stricken, you know, uh, hunger-haunted parts of the world that, that I know in Africa or in Central America and places like that. I don't know. I know there must be a great deal of despair, and yet people have to fight on, you know, a great deal of situational unhappiness. How is that to be separated? What's the advantage of, of saying they have depression and saying you've got to buy these medicines? What is the advantage of that? You know, I was a PhD examiner, someone who looked at the spread of Western psychiatry and governmental health in India. 
in so-called Indian community mental health teams, which basically meant Western-trained Indian psychiatrists get in their cars in the cities and they drive out into the countryside for an hour or two with a team. And the peasants queue up, you know, as it were, um, to see them in a rural, 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 rural you know, rural people's uh, subsistence farmers and the like, see them, and they apply DSM categories to them and tell them they've got to buy this medicine or whatever. And one woman was heard to say she came out of the clinic uh, by the PhD student uh, who, I'm exa- who I examined. You know, I've got so many problems, and now they tell me I've got one more. There's something wrong with my brain. What is that? What is that? Did they ask for this? Did they ask to, for us to come and def- redefine their mentality? Essentially, the shape of the scholarship driving this is imperialist, really. The danger is, of course, that it will obscure, and this is, of course, a fundamental part of the critique that we all have, the, it can serve to obscure the social and, econ- and economic and political philosophies yeah, that have produced unhappiness and make it an individual problem. And, of course, the Nervi in post-Soviet Latvia, that wonderful paper by Vieda Skultens that I've quoted, and when a, a patient went to the doctor and said, I have Nervi, it was sort of, it was, it might have been some psychological stuff, like, a, you know, I'm feeling nervous or something. It may be some physical stuff. I have aches and pains. But it was also understood in Latvia that Nervi embodied a complaint against these sort of clumsinesses, yeah, and inefficiencies of a centralist economy in the Soviet bloc in Latvia, when Latvia was part of the Soviet bloc. That was understood. Now the doctors are taught that there's no such thing as Nervi. They go to uh, meetings on depression where the doctors first are taught that there's such a thing as depression and aided by the translation into Latvian of DSM. And these are sponsored by drug companies. So then first the doctors are taught this category called depression. And then they teach the patients that they must speak in the language of depression, not nervy. The shift here that I'm describing is depression is something that becomes their problem only. This is another case of depression. Nervy in part was part of a general social complaint about conditions and jobs as well. So now we don't have nervy and we have depression. Yet, in fact, since the fall of the Soviet Union, Latvia has become much poorer. Life is objectively much more insecure. You know, this huge unemployment. It's a very poor little uh, Baltic country. You have every reason to have nervy. But that's now depression. And depression says nothing about the society. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, but this is how things work. Once you say... I'm going to call something an it, and I'm going to locate it between your ears. You have moved away from social space. And it's interesting how, um, I mean, as you know from your own training, your psychology is held to be something that we might find or you know is there between your ears. That's where you find it. I suppose the lesson of being a doctor for many years and some psychiatry is that if you're trying to find something, you won't necessarily find it between someone's ears. It's in the field of play through which they move. Yeah? with its positives and negatives, you know, its anxieties, its threats, and that our psychology is kind of how we move in all of that. That's our psychology. It's outside our heads. And certainly, I think some of the clearest cut so-called mental health work I've done is when I simply help people with their social problems. The, those torture victims who are over here, what they wanted was housing and, and schools for the kids and that sort of thing. And uh, they didn't want trauma work. They didn't need trauma work. It could have been easier to call them all PTSD. So why do we use these diagnoses for these people? Obviously, this is not to play down the fact that people do break down. People go mad. Um, Again, whether those categories are suitable. In Zimbabwe, I'm distressed by how quickly these same Western-taught doctors and nurses uh, call a patient schizophrenic with all that baggage on the first on the, you know, on the first presentation, and again, misinterpret things like voices, uh, which may just be an idiom of distress, as indicating they've got schizophrenia. And if they've got the medications above when they run out of medication, they'll be left on antipsychotics. So it's understood that if you've got that, you need to stay on antipsychotics, this class of drugs called antipsychotics, for a very long time. You know? Absurd. You know the famous WHO studies in the 70s where they looked at what they call schizophrenia in about 10 or 12 countries, including many, several African countries like Nigeria. And they were embarrassed to find that on the whole, people with quote unquote schizophrenia seem to get better quicker and have less handicap than they did in the West. And they said, well, that can't be right. I mean, we are so knowledgeable, you know, we're white. <laughs> you know, we, how can, how can, how can they, how can they in Nigeria when they only got one sky the whole country or none? How can they be doing better? You see, how do you turn that round? Well, of course, the truth is that they were assuming everything could be captured by the rubric schizophrenia. There may be in short-term uh, reactive psychosis, which you can get the third world, you get better without you know, any long-term handicap. There may have been just 
syndromes of distress which were mislabeled as psychosis and therefore the word was schizophrenia. So they were assuming that their labels, he's like depression, will do right around the world. And this is gross. It's gross. It's intellectually shallow. It's unbelievably self-serving. And it's pro-business. So another issue you've raised with the global mental health movement is the failure of these programs to allow for indigenous knowledge systems to count in the same way that randomized control trials count in the West. How do these alternative ways of knowing come to be excluded and what might they have to offer? Indigenous knowledge systems do not count in this. They don't count. They not seem to have anything to say. They're sort of an exotic side thing. Uh, the government health people in their most publications make no mention of indigenous systems, healers and that, except presumably to, to cast them as being getting in the way of proper treatment. Wise old women, bone setters, traditional healers, um, Sangomas in Zimbabwe and, and South Africa, these are who are women traditional healers. All this stuff is there. Um, some people go to it, some don't. And if you were to ask an uh, indigenous healer, tell me, how do you, how can you, how do you know you, your stuff works? How does it work? He would say something like, well, I've got some satisfied customers and people continue to come to me. Other people don't. You know, they have a choice. Some people come, some don't. That would be the single, that's if you like an anthropological defense, an anthropologically framed defense. That would be the single best defense that the Western mental health industry could have, actually. But they're not going to use that defense because they, are, they see themselves as a branch of science and of medical science. And so they want to use the research methods of, of medical science to show the efficacy of their work. And of course, it's very difficult to do. I mean, the number of people on antidepressants continues to rise, but no one says, oh, well, I mean, we've got all these cured cases now. You know, where do you get that from? Or that suicide rates don't change. Or the fact that we've had antipsychotics for 60 years and schizophrenics are no more likely to be, uh, you know, the lead of an orchestra or in politics or, you know, the guy who services your car. People who pick up labels like schizophrenia are no closer to the mainstream where we all are than they used to be. So what kind of success is that? So, I mean, really, using the methods of science shows really very modest results we get. You know. The strongest thing about antipsychotics and antidepressants is, just the name. Because they presuppose that there is a sort of psychosis area or there's a depression area to do with, uh, you know, um, serotonin and dopamine and all of this. And that these drugs, the name suggests these drugs know where to go. You take them into your stomach or into your you know, an injection, and they know where to go in the brain because they are antidepressant. This is, this is a marketing thing. You know, these drugs are basically sedatives, or most psychiatric drugs are sedatives. Antidepressants are slightly sedative, variably, and slightly space you out a bit in some people, which is good and bad. Antipsychotics are strong sedatives, as we know. Um, the long-term side effects of people who, are, who men, spend many years on antidepressants and many years on antipsychotics is Another thing that simply has not been taken seriously and solved in Western psychiatry before they recommend them to the rest of the world, etc. So, I mean, it's um, one has to take, and this is why, of course, people don't, you know, on the mainstream who've got their commitments and have got their interests, don't really want to find it hard to hear this stuff because one is questioning business as usual. For us to think about how do we, you know, let's really look at whether, in fact, life expectancy in schizophrenia is, is in part shortened by taking chlorpromazine type drugs for 30 years or the new ones, whatever, you know, that they may have their own, you know, if you wrap cotton wool around a brain for 30 years, you change that person. You don't make them, it doesn't exactly improve their, their you know, their capacity to be with us in the world with other people. You know, when you've got the stuff wrapped around your brain, it must, for many people, make subtle but pervasive background differences to how they function. And then, of course, the question is whether they have card cardiogenic, uh, you know, cardiovascular related effects now with the new ones. So, I mean, our evidence base in the West is quite modest, to say the least. Yeah. What psychiatry, I think, is quite good at, actually, is if someone's in crisis or maybe about to kill themselves, and some people are, uh, then clearly putting them in a place, you know, which used to be called asylum in the proper, proper old term of the word, you know, is may well be in the short term. Um, you know, a very um, appropriate thing to do, but it's not necessarily diagnosis-based. You know, the whole profession operates around diagnoses and treatments for diagnoses, uh, really, and people have to fit into those boxes. Well, you know, that's because we want to make it look like science. You know, it's terribly problematic. Indeed, even in the talk therapies, I might just say, 
as you know, there's only one positive predictive factor for good outcomes. The patient appreciate what had happened and felt something useful had happened. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? This is true of all talk therapies from one-off counseling through to 10 years of five days a week psychoanalysis. What is the one positive predictive factor, Justin? Would that be the uh, oh, therapeutic alliance? That's right. Yeah, what they think of the therapist. Absolutely. What the patient thinks of the therapist. In other words, the therapist's ordinary qualities, which I'm not saying some of them can't be worked up and trained a bit, but still the patient's, the therapist's sort of ordinary qualities of listening and empathizing and connecting are doing most of the work. And it's not clear where the science fits in. So, I mean, this, you know, this isn't sort of happy stuff, is it, in terms of this huge industry, huge, huge industry that we've created um, and which we've embedded in the culture. Well, we can swallow our own stuff. Um, I see no basic take a divorce has not been asked for. They've got huge other problems. The world's getting, more con you know, getting worse. I mean, global warming is beginning to affect you know, hotter parts of the world, the middle of Africa, some parts of Zimbabwe are beginning to dry out and not become um, good for arable land anymore. These sorts of these things are huge things are going on. And we're coming along and asking about mental health. You know, I just think it's absurd. I think it's an embarrassment, actually. That's not to say there aren't people, as I say out there, who have got something you can call a mental health problem. They may have an AIDS dementia, for example. I've seen a lot of that over here. Clearly, all these sorts of things, physical things. Um, but I don't think there's any basis for scaling up even if there's the money for it, scaling up Western mental health approaches into third world countries, accompanied by um, the pharmaceutical industry, et cetera. You know, I don't think that it's not been asked for. I, I think it's, um, I would actually want to, in many ways, I'd like to impede these programs on the whole, to be honest. But it's very difficult. Um, someone who spoke to me frankly about this uh, once was Byron Good. He's um, one of the world's most famous medical anthropologists. One thing that's curious about that, yeah, about this whole business is that people who we've always referred to and used their publications in relation to these critiques, which would include people like uh, Arthur Kleinman, particularly, um, and, and Byron Good as well. Uh, you know, I read his stuff on Iran and all this years ago, American anthropology. Somehow, these same people and uh, you know Harvard has turned to the bi back to the biological. In many ways. Myron Good is writing, and so is um, Kleinman, in a sense, in endorsement of all of these governmental health initiatives, in endorsement of them. And Byron Good actually um, said to me, he thought that my own work was, was almost unethical because he thought I deterred well, projects that were well needed from going out there by my writings, which is fine, I don't mind that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's very interesting, and, and Byron Good, you know, continues to see that PTSD is an appropriate concept to use in post-tsunami Indonesia and whatever. So it's very, uh, it, it is quite interesting. Um, whereas I would have thought the past, their past publications weren't like this. There is something, you know, there is something turning back to the biological in all of this uh, somewhere. Yeah, I want to ask a question about this. Uh, I know Kleinman is one of the authors of the recent Lancet report. And the new report adopts more of a yes, language yes. of social determinants and psychosocial yes, understandings yes. of distress than the previous reports have. However, the recommended yes. interventions and the treatments still seem to be based largely exactly. on Western mental health practices. Yes. Latest events well, I haven't close health. read the new report, but I, I have the sense, and others have commented uh, uh, that um, in, in close reading it, they are paying a bit more attention. I think they, um, it's interesting. I mean, it may well be that they are slightly acknowledging our critiques, um, I've heard Vikram Patel, who's one of the luminaries in that business, uh, start to make some reference to anthropology, which was interesting, and he didn't do that a while back. However, as you say, you've, you've concluded yourself, the thrust is, is, appears to be the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still feeling that Western categories work, uh, Western uh, research methods work. Um, local cultural things are, if anything, an obstacle. I think they do, they do nod their heads in the direction of social cultural determinants of distress and disease. They may be nodding it a bit more, but they are not proposing, you know, works in those domains, are they? And they're not proposing that clearly we've got to get our economic and so, you know, social conditions to improve and, and the, the health or mental health or whatever you want to call it of the people would improve. They're still proposing individualized approaches based on individualized diagnosis, as far as I can see. So I, I think there was a relaunch of some kind for new publicity, but it's the same. And of course, they have the WHO on their side very much, it seems. You know, the WHO, with a, po you know, with, with, with a straight face, publishes charts 
showing the incidence of major mental disorders, including things like panic disorder or, you know, anorexia in various countries of the world. And they have a figure. You can see, you'll see a figure for Southeast Asia or maybe even for a country like Cambodia. Incidence, prevalence, population prevalence of panic disorder, 0.2. You know, what? Oh, this is complete rubbish. How could they possibly generate those things? And assume that the category is ranked to, you know, this is just spurious research. As I say, I do think that most of the cross-cultural research done by the psychiatric mainstream on non-Western subjects is useless. It's worse than useless. You wouldn't want anyone to read it because it will, it would it distort research and other pr priorities, in my view. Once things are not valid, there's very little you can do about it, I'm afraid. I remember seeing in the JAMA a few years ago, a good guy published a review of the, re the research mental health literature. You know, they're trying to get, I think, differences of culture. Uh, so this, these are non-Western research subjects. Um, and he looked at 180 papers that have been published in mainstream psychiatric or medical journals that would qualify as being sort of some sort of really substantial paper. 80% of them used only use Western checklists, 80 only, and even the others went, were not much. So what is, what is the worth of that stuff? What's the worth of the checklist is they tell me that one person in four in Britain has got a mental disorder. If one person in four in Britain and the US has got a mental disorder, we really do have to give up and go back to the lab and say, just a minute, can we just review what we mean by mental disorder? And we'll never agree on that because it's a philosophical thing. In a way, isn't it? You know, except defined by a set of transactions. A set, you know, well, I'm going to find a mental disorder if you say, if you get six out of these eight questions, then you've got it. Well, that's constructing a mental disorder. It's not finding one. So whilst we are heir to break down and distress and to dangerous and self-dangerous behavior, it is true. I'm not sure how these things uh, help to tackle those things around the world. And of course, the danger is, you know, we were talking about how these things take attention away from sociopolitical and, and economic predicaments that, that many people are in. And, you know, they talk about the episode of child mental health in Britain. Now, we've had austerity since the 2008 crash. There's quite a lot of child poverty emerging in Britain. There are food banks in Britain. I mean, you've had them for a long time. These are new things here. But you don't see them talking about what's the children growing up in, in poverty in, in, in families in Britain who are dropping out of the social uh, welfare system and all that. No, 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 you're not hearing about it. You're hearing about an epidemic of child mental health. That doesn't take any political questions. And, you know, this has been used by the Indian government. I mean, that PhD thesis that I, uh, the, the, the Indian one, uh, I, I did another one. I was a, a, an examiner for another one where he was looking at farmer suicides in India. Did you know that? Over 200,000 small farmers have committed suicide in India in the last 25 years, mostly taking insecticides they'd had to buy from Monsanto to kill themselves. They had to buy from Monsanto for the genetically engineered cotton, which they'd been persuaded to start up and dump their indigenous crops. So this was a huge kind of near little enterprise. You know, it's about that. And they found they were ruined and, the, you know, genetically modified cotton did go up in price. Um, they were locked into buying seeds every year, as previously in the, the indigenous seeds were self-replicating. They had to buy, uh, in, you know, uh, insecticides because the new, you know, the, the new bugs, the bugs in the area were um, were harmful to the new seeds, whereas the old seeds had developed immunity. All of this, they were ruined, and 200,000 have killed themselves. The comment by, made by the Indian government with when this was raised was, you can see the instance of depression in India and how we need more psychiatrists. This is an issue. And I've seen that written in The Lancet, too. The epidemics of, of depression among small farmers in India show up how much mental health problems there are in third world countries um, and how we need more psychiatrists. Now, the global mental health agenda is part of that. Yeah. They have no problem with saying that. They believe that. And they may nod towards poverty, but their methods are other and unasked for. And they can't solve the validity problem. So we must use our methods. I, I just, I don't know what they're doing. I do not know what they're doing. The damaging effects of these categories, I mean, especially schizophrenia, I think this is a huge one, a really huge one. When I ask these students, what assessments do you make with a diagnosis of schizophrenia? And they say things like, which we've had over here, you'll never get better. You'll never be able to work. And you'll have to take medication for a long time. So they're using the schizophrenia to apply to a range of people who are freaking out in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe, none of which I would want to call schizophrenia. There might be some recurrent cases over many years. Okay, that's similar to, but they're having psychotic or psychotic-like episodes. And if they come to medical attention, they ten, will tend to pick up a label like schizophrenia. This doesn't do them much good. Any more than 
you know, as I say, it's not exactly transformed the prospects of people who pick up the label in the West over 60 years, taking that medication for years and years and years. I want to bring our focus to the issue of poverty and the political mm-hmm. structures that you've mentioned in the past. In your work, you refer to the problem of doing mental health interventions in a broken social world. What does yeah. it mean to be in a broken social world? And how does taking this fact into account change our mental health interventions? Well, what I've based this on is obviously uh, my observations in Zimbabwe and in other African countries uh, and other places I've done field work, like in Gaza and, of course, in Nicaragua, number one. Number two, you know, I worked for 10 years with refugees um, and the like, and then these 15, 16 years with people who were refugees but were often Africans as well, you know, with HIV, carrying HIV and, or dying of HIV, whatever. A common thread running right through, of course, was social disadvantage, lack of social capital, the kind of social capital you and I can take uh, for granted in our own worlds. Straight poverty, you know, marginalization, insecurity, liability to be uh, ejected out of the country or whatever. But in particular, when I use a phrase like drugs, I'm thinking about Africa uh, in the third world. You know, in something like Zimbabwe, I'll tell you, what, what do you mean by broken social work? I mean, clearly, societies have, been, uh, have often been chewed up by civil wars and whatever, and, you know, the normal structures don't function. That's one kind. Here, I'm talking as much about the effects of poverty and lack of opportunities. You know, in Zimbabwe, take Zimbabwe, for example, only one person in 30 who is nominally seeking work has a formal job. The, un- the unemployment rate is about 97%. So only a tiny proportion of people have, a, have the security of a regular income, small or great, usually small, and you know some sort of job security. The other 29, 27 or so, are either being supported by the few that are working uh, in the sort of extended African patronage system, or are hustling on the streets to sell this, that, and the other. Do you know what I mean? You're doing, picking up a bit of menial work on the odd day or whatever, yeah? People are in despair there, you know, in despair there. The, you know, half the country's food insecure. Uh, that's true of a lot of Africa. You know, that's what I mean by broken social worlds. What the minimum of what you and I would think that society should deliver to its citizens is not being delivered, if indeed it ever was. All one means is that the whole, you know, the whole, the whole of psychiatry developed with the assumption of a stable backdrop that, you know, if you like, that, why, that the, the mentality and what was in the mind of your patient could be taken for what it was because the background was a given, you know, if like, you know, something like a, some sort of social stability or at least constancy or whatever. But I mean, it would be the same thing. I mean, you know, you, if you've got a homeless tramp who's, uh, you know, sleeping under a bridge in Boston or something and talking a lot of rubbish, you know, it could be just rubbish. Maybe he's drunk, maybe he's having too many drugs. Maybe he's got a mental illness. Even there, You have some trouble to see. You're going to have more trouble than usual in disentangling what might be called psychiatric from the broader predicament that this guy is in and has been in. That's one of the reasons why, you know, doctors have always been said to be at their best in communicating with patients like themselves and others, patients in the same social group, you could say. Yeah. And, you know, social class one doctors interviewing sort of illiterate coal miners, say, like in the old days, were likely to misinterpret and misunderstand things because they didn't understand their world. So, it, but basically, the broken social world is just the other the other basic stem of the uh, of our critique. One is again fundamental questions of epistemology and culture. You know, what is a mental disorder? Who claims it? Um, why should there be some universality on these matters when you know we've only classified them ourselves in, you know, in the last 30, 40 years, or since DSM one in 1952, etc. Uh, and the other pole is broken social worlds, poverty disruption, displacement, you know, what is that? You know, uh, what is the space between the ears of, of each of those persons? One can say, well, that's mental health, and I can capture it there. What about going outside of them? Their psychologies and, and you know, and their, what morale they have, and all things are having to be played out in, in you know, insecure and inefficient, insufficient worlds in a ways that probably you and our, my life have not had to be done. We need to be a bit more respectful, you know, of difference. This is difference, you know. Again, I think Western scholarship is, has been, in, in, certainly in this, has been shallow and naive, self-serving, really. And in that sense, you know, it has followed for me an imperialist dynamic, actually. You know. How would it change our interventions? With those peoples over the years, the way that I feel that I've helped them, the way that it is when I've helped them with the broken social world, as I think I said earlier, you know, 
uh, sometimes accessing a, accessing a bit of funds, or sometimes I used to feel myself, Jesus, I just used to pull money out of my wallet and give it to them. Actually, you want to make a difference, and being feeling somehow stalked by the gulf between my world, you know, the world opportunities I've had and the world opportunities this person has had, but basically help them with social provision, housing, and things like that. Um, that's if you want to call it mental health work, you can call it that. You know, in other words, I think it's much harder to live an incoherent life. Um, and perhaps that's the other thing about our psychologies being outside of ourselves is that our psychologies lie in the extent to which we can live a coherent or incoherent life, which means we have opportunities and, and, and you know, uh, day-to-day possibilities, whatever. And of course, refugees and others whose world's been turned upside down are struggling with incoherence, if you like. And the business of recovering some sort of coherence and getting back some of the rhythms of everyday life, now that's treatment. That is treatment but it doesn't come through the clinic. You know, I think that uh, what's fundamental for me about the whole uh, Western uh, mental health industry is that it is too big. It claims too much. It exaggerates at what it does. It won't look at the side effects, not, not honestly, of what it has done, and uh, no doubt, and particularly long-term prescribing. And it assumes it can go anywhere with its own knowledge, and that is fine. You know, I mean, this is... Uh, <laughs> This is sort of triply unhelpful, I have to say. Thank you. I want to thank you for making the time to be on our podcast and also thank you for your tireless advocacy and tireless work on these issues. It's been a real pleasure having you on the Mad America podcast. That's wonderful. Thanks. Well, I just want to thank Justin and Dr. Summerfield for that powerful and comprehensive interview and to say that if you'd like to read more about Dr. Summerfield's work, you can find links on the post that accompanies this interview on madinamerica.com. So thanks for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.